not over till the lead way. Jeff Fuller really is hot for a $4,000 victory. Russ Erland's explosive competition in the late models at Volusia. Plus a look at the biggest competition car show of them all, Racerama 1990. cars and motorsports right here in the Northeast before the 1990 season begins. Because we're here in West Springfield, Massachusetts for Racerama 1990. And it's kind of the kickoff when racing begins for all of us here in the Northeast. Hello, I'm Ben Dodge and I welcome you to yet another edition of Race Week. Well, as you can see, we're located right here in the Better Living Center and there are literally thousands of people around. As we stand in the Start Finish Productions booth, as we prepare for another exciting edition of Race Week. Well, in this edition of Race Week, besides taking a look at the Racerama event, we'll also be taking a look back at Volusia County Speedway as we go back and take a look at the excitement of NASCAR modified racing, this time Southern style during Speed Week's 1990. In addition to all of that, we'll also be talking with some of the promoters, race teams as they tell us what's in store as the 90 season is about to begin and in some cases in less than a couple of weeks. We'll also be talking with the front running drivers, of several different teams as they tell us how they've prepared for another impressive season of competition. But right now the racing action begins Southern style with a look back at Speed Week's 1990 from Volusia County Speedway. Tuesday night competition was the first appearance of the modifieds ever at Volusia County. Jay Hedgecock would make up the front row after turning in fast time with Tom Baldwin. Second row was Jerry Cranmer and Phil Smith, and three rows back, Jimmy Waits and Andy Romano. As the field would go to green almost instantly, it would be car number 41 for Hedgecock to start to string it out at the front of the field. But for Tom Baldwin, a different story was being told. To the outside would go Cranmer before he'd bobble and have a problem, and Waits would pick up the spot. But it was still Baldwin who was holding on desperately to the number two spot. Then it was Tommy Bowles drilling in on Cramner. Cramner just couldn't handle in the bottom groove, and Bowles would pick up the four spot. Tom Bowles was on a move heading to the front of this field. But the leader of the pack was still Jay Hedgecock. He would hold on to secure the victory. Jimmy Winks would finish in the number two spot over Tommy Bowles in third, Jerry Cramner, and Gary Myers. The Dirt Lay models are also the star of this show with a feature event 30 laps in distance. Jim Kleine would be to the inside of Bob Blonde as they head into turn number one. Before the first lap was complete, it was Larry Zen who'd worked his way up to second. Then a new challenge was starting to develop. John Lehorn on the outside with car number two. As Mike Head would move to the inside with a 54. Challenge now for the lead. Zen would go to the outside. He'd take over the lead from Jim Kleine as it was now Zen in command of this event. Zen would start to pull away and dominate the racing action to the checker. Finishing number two spot was Jim Klein over Bob Blount, finishing in third. Wednesday night competition, again the modifieds were up in a major part of the program. To the inside of the front row was Jimmy Winks, and it was Charlie Pastriak outside of the front row. Jerry Cramer would look strong to the inside as Pastriak would try to challenge Winks for the lead. Off the turn, Winks would get the bite. Here comes Cramer to the inside. He tuck it down low and try to take over position number two. Tom Bowles moves in. He works the bottom side well, and Bowles now has the third spot. Pastriak tries to fight back. Hedgecock moves in. Contact is made, and Pastriak goes around. Hedgecock manages to squeak by. But when the field goes to caution, it is Keith Cocker who slams the wall hard with his number three. Cocker takes a long rejected walk to the pitter, and his car looks like more of an accordion than a race car at this point. He is definitely out of the series in the competition here. But when things go back to green, it is Jimmy Winks who gets on the throttle and starts to pull away. Cranmer has his share of problems in the handles department, and Bobby Park is running strong, working his way back to the top five. It is Romano who challenges to the inside, and Charlie Rudolph battles back with Pastriak to work his way into the fourth spot. The two almost make contact, and Pastriak maintains his position. Now it is Bobby Park beneath Rudolph as he puts some pressure on. Rudolph holds on in the outside groove, way out in front is still Wink. And now to the bottom goes Romano. He tucks it down low, picks up the spot from Bobby Park, and he is now among the top four cars. Closing laps of competition, Winks is the leader of the pack. 
Cranmer is reeling him down at the checker. It is Jimmy Winks to take down the victory. Finishing in second is Jerry Cranmer over Charlie Rudolph, Tommy Bowles, and Andy Romano. After a five-year layoff, Teddy Marsh and Jimmy Winks were back in the winner's circle. Lay model feature of M was up next, and it was Jerry Child on the inside of the front row with Rich Bickle with car number 45. Second row, Steve Carlson and Joe Shear. Three rows back, it was Bobby Giles. As the field would go to green right up front, the excitement was already starting to begin in turn number one. Shear was running the bottom, and Bickle was setting the pace out in front. Child was hung out to dry on the outside, but would still fight back impressively. New contender moving in would suddenly become a challenge by Steve Carlson with car number 50. Carlson was on a roll. He sat in the third spot, but Shear would work to the inside of Bickle and take over position number one. Suddenly a spin would occur. Kim Wallace off turn number four would come back just in front of the lead pack of cars. And they all thought that a caution came out. But it didn't come out, and that would give Bickle position number one. Shear would be forced to settle for second, and Mike Head would move in as factor number three with car number 54. It was now a race nose to tail as Shear was wheeling him in on the final circuit of competition. Joe Shear would look to the outside, try to take over position number one. Biddle would run the inside groove. Final circuit right down to the wire. This one would roll. No question about it. It would be a race to the checker. Bickle was on the inside, off the fourth turn, but Shear would nose him out by inches. Rich Bickle would finish in second. Mike Head was third, and Steve Carlson would round out the top four, followed by Bobby Gill. It was a well-earned victory by Joe Shear with car number 36. Next, the racing action will be shipped to a 100-lap special event for the Monophon. Jeff Fuller will be starting right up front after turning in fast time, and Phil Smith would be making up the outside front row. The excitement of open-wheel modified racing was about to begin for the final feature event of the series for them, as the field would go to green. It was Jeff Fuller to take command of the event. Phil Smith was right there on his back bumper, and Hedgecock was working the outside of Jerry Cramner. Tom Holt was setting in the fifth spot. Cramner was battling to the inside down low. Not enough steam, but he'd stay glued to the back bumper of Smith as they come back to the line. It was Tommy Bowles and Jimmy Winks just out of the top five now, but working their way in contention. As Hedgecock got stuck in the outside group, things got bobbled up as Charlie Pastriak would drop out of the competition with car number five. But it was Jeff Fuller in command. Cramner still hunting him down. Lap traffic would tell the story here. Suddenly, Bowles would stop on the racetrack. A tire problem would be the story for car number 76. Once things got back up to green, the story would be now told on pit road. Hedgecock was in the pit area. Phil Smith was in. The story was now tires in this extra distance, extra cash, 100 lap program. But Jeff Fuller was still the leader of the pack. Cramner was right there on his back bumper. Winks was still setting in position number three. Trouble now, Tom Baldwin would go around with car number seven. Baldwin would spin, and that would bring out a caution and tighten things back up once again. As car number seven would have to do it this time from the back of the pack. As the racing action would resume at the front of the field, there'd still be a great battle going on for position number three. This time it was Gary Myers who would go to the outside of car number 55 for Jimmy Wink. But taking down the impressive victory was Jeff Fuller with car number double zero. Jerry Crown would finish in second, Jimmy Winks was third, fourth was Gary Myers, and fifth was Charlie Rudolph. An impressive $4,000 victory for the young and talented Jeff Fuller. On Sunday, it was a special 100-lap event for the late model. Jason Keller would be starting up front with Bobby Gill, and on the inside of the second row, David Rogers and Steve Carlson. If the field would initially go to green, Bill Beggarly Jr. would have a problem with left rear suspension, and he'd send a parade of sparks with car number 28. This would tighten things up just a bit. Back to the front of the field, Dave Rogers had taken over the lead from Jason Keller. Rogers was on a roll, but so wasn't Joe Shear. And shortly thereafter, it was Shear who'd take back position number one with car number 36. But that wouldn't be the only lead change in this event. There was more battling going on. Chuck Trentham would work his way from the middle of the pack, threading the needle to get to the front of this field. Then a bold move would occur as Tom Carlson would work his way to the outside of Shear and take over the number one spot. Junior Hanley would next break through the pack, and he'd have number one for a while, forcing Carlson to settle for second. Then it was Kim Wallace who'd spin with car number six. This would send several of the front-running teams to the pits for tires, including the Joe Shear number 36. Back up front, Junior Hanley and Dave Rogers were duking it out lap after lap, and Rogers would get the bite and take advantage and take back position number one. Hanley was still hunting him down and wouldn't give up. Then it was Chuck Trentham to work his way to the inside. The two would make contact, and that would send body panels flying off the Hanley machine, car number 72. Then Hanley would try to come back down. Chuck Trentham was up higher on the racetrack, and then Trentham would try to bring it down low. Suddenly, Russ Ehrlich 
would literally slam the wall hard, no place to go, ride it all the way down to the front straightaway, then slam it again to the inside of turn number one. The Russ Erland machine was severely damaged, but when it was back to green, it was Dave Rogers, the leader of the pack, holding him right there to contend with him as Steve Carlson with car number 50. It was Dave Rogers to set in the winner's circle, finishing second with Steve Carlson over Tom Carlson, Rich Mickle, and Ted Musgrave. Well, it looks like I've got myself in another one of those jams. And speaking of jams, what about Russ Erland? I mean, he had his share of problems in the final late model event at Volusia County. And how about a hats off, congratulations has to go to Jeff Fuller. I mean, he was really impressive. His first and only visit ever to Volusia County, and he was able to get the job done and the win and the modified in Joe Brady's number double zero. You know, next we'll be taking a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll be taking a look at more of the cars and more of the stars from Racerama 1990. As I try to get myself out of this jam, and it's not going to be that easy, trust me. Welcome back to Race Week. Well, as you can see, the big hot colors going into the 90s seem to be day glow. And Mark Fleury's car is definitely in style when it comes to trend setting for 1990. Well, you remember before the commercial break, I promised you that I'd be introducing a lot of the stars and a lot of the cars from Racerama 90. Well, the Lebanon Valley Speedway is one of the most successful dirt tracks in the country. And next, I'm going to show you just one of the reasons, well, not exactly, but close enough why. Hello, Tiffany. How are we doing? Good. How are you? Good. Tiffany, you are one of the contestants to be Miss Lebanon Valley for 1990. I want to tell you something right up front. I think you could win this thing hands down. Tell us about the contest. Well, um, at the beginning of the year, right before the um, first race, they have a contest, and all the girls, they come into the clubhouse, and they talk about themselves and why they want to be Miss Lebanon Valley, and um, the judges go from there. Let's talk a little bit about Lebanon Valley this season. A lot going on. Saturday night program going to consist of the best that dirt racing has to offer? Yeah, every year the best racing is every Saturday night and drag racing on Sundays. Well, you know, it looks like you're matching Mark Fleury's new car. Was this something kind of planned or did it just all kind of happen? Well, I noticed that all the speed cars this year have a lot of fluorescent colors, a lot of bright stuff. So I, you know, went with the, the colors and I decided to get like a really bright spinning suit to wear. Well, there's no question about it. This car being Wild Thing and Tiffany being a part of the Lebanon Valley lineup, there's a lot of hot excitement happening on dirt at Lebanon Valley Speedway. All of the ADAP cars were on hand for this event, including the ADAP representative from dirt, Eddie Marshall. We've joined the ADAP team uh, since last year, and uh, we're part of a team with Charlie Rudolph, the Asphalt Modifieds, and Ken Bouchard with the Bush Grand National, and we're going to represent them on the, the dirt circuit uh, uh, with a new uh, ADAP 72 uh, Olsen Dirt Modified. Uh, and we're really looking forward to it. We're going to run Lebanon Valley on a steady basis and, of course, really look forward to the Syracuse events. And uh, we plan on uh, making a real good effort to try to run as many of the special races as we can. Uh, I have an older car that we're going through and trying to gear up uh, uh, to run some of the asphalt shows. And this car here we're going to run weekly at Lebanon Valley. and. Uh, uh, try to, you know, really uh, do a good job for ADAP and everybody this year and uh, win some races and have some fun. We're certainly uh, going to be shooting for the track championship at Lebanon Valley. Uh, uh, that's something that we've been trying to get for a while and falling short the uh, last couple years. Uh, but that's something that we're going to be real hungry for and, uh, you know, going after. And uh, uh, Syracuse is something uh, that you know, really has uh, me interested and we're, you know, going to give a full effort to that and try to do as good as we can there. Hopefully come out of Syracuse at some point with a win. And another new team with new colors was car number 27 for Jim Boniface, a front runner at both Monadnock and Claremont. Well, this is a brand new Rosner chassis again. It'll be a TA motor in it and he made a few changes from last year and um, I think it's, it's for the better, you know. It's genuine Miller Genuine Draft this year. Uh, we changed the number to number 27. I think it's going to be luckier than the 88 because that's my older number when I had it three or four years ago. Well, we're going to be running Manadnock every Friday night. Then we're going to run Star on Saturday night and down to Thompson. Then we're going to go to some open shows like up to Lee and Oxford. 
stuff like that. We're going to travel around a little bit. And hopefully we're going to have a good season like doing that. Well, our goal is to win the, the track championship at Monadnock, and hopefully we can do really well up the star for the regional points and some really good finishes at the open shows throughout New England. Speaking of the Star Speedway, the owner and promoter of the Star oh, Speedway, Bobby yeah. Weber, is taking on a new challenge for 1990. He'll also be the owner and promoter of the Hudson Speedway. Well, we think it's going to be a good time. It, it's um, the two tracks that run together many years ago, and I've been in staff for 10 years, and we thought about Hudson before, but now this winter, we've well, we've done it. We bought the place. Things are going to go pretty much the same way they were last year during 1990 and then in 1991 we're going to expand it time together even more well, what's, the, what's going to happen at hudson speedway what actually made you want to go out and buy another speedway well we're in the racing business and we tend to stay for a long time the bud white lightnings the feature division there they'll continue to be they'll be 100 percent compatible with the star bud lights plus the street stocks will be the same they've also got Thunders and Strictly stocks there, and our mini stocks ran there a number of times, and they'll continue to run the same with the midgets. Star will go pretty much the same way we did in 1989, in conjunction with the Winston Racing Series. We were successful in that, and we had four of the top ten from the region came from our ranks. Those guys, as well as a lot more, want to go back to Nashville. Now, the Super Modifieds will continue to run weekly. They'll be there every Saturday night. We get 30 dates at each racetrack, and really, I just can't wait for the season to get underway. Stay tuned. We'll be right back to more race week right after this. Then I can show you some more beautiful cars. Well, as you can see, there are plenty of beautiful automobiles here at Racerama 90. I mean, these individuals have really prepared these cars, and they look more like show cars than actual race cars. But there's one thing that you can count on, that most of these cars that look so beautiful now, they'll be racing and reaching speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour each and every week during the summer months of competition. There's a lot going on, and we've still got a lot left to show you and teams like Dickie Cerevello's team right here will be showing us and telling us about what they are planning on doing for the 1990 season. Let's go take a walk around the room and talk with more of the individuals that will help build the excitement for another impressive season of competition. Mike Whedon has done well in the pro stocks and now he looks to try his skills once again back in the Bush Grand National North Circuit for 1990. Well, we're going to be racing with some of the same people that I race pro stocks with. Dennis Gagliotti is going to be my crew chief. We're going to run the entire north schedule, and we're going to try to run a couple of combination races, as well as getting out to the new track at New Hampshire International. And we're going to run a pro stock as much as we can also. What made you get back into the Bush Ranch National Division? Well, it's a super form of racing, and I, I've always enjoyed it, and we like running the uh, different tracks every once in a while. This year we got a little bit of sponsorship from All Pro Auto Parts and uh, competition cams and um, people helping us out and we're going to try it. Well, we're hoping to get right back in the thick of things right away, but you just can't take anything for granted. You, you're going to have to work at it. We ran the full schedule in 87, but then we ran, went with the uh, Pro Stocks for two years. So things change a little bit, the rules change a little, so there'll be a little bit of time for adjustments. Well, we're going to try to keep out of trouble, and uh, we're going to do as much racing as our pocketbook will allow. Jim Martell has won best appearing in the Racerama show before, but then he was the driver. Now he's just the owner of this car. Well, it's just a little bit of showmanship, I guess, and pride in the cars. We build them to try to make them look as good as they go, but we've had some bad luck years. Hopefully this year we're going to have a good luck year. I got Rick Burrell driving for me, and Dale Shaw will be driving the big open shows on the Oxford Plains Speedway with us, so we're hoping to have a good year. Uh, we're we're going to be running Lee on a regular basis, and we are going to run the Oxford Plains as many times as we can, hopefully to make all the big shows at Beach Ridge, Manadnock, Seekonk. We're hoping to run them all if we can. Limited schedule, unless we get some big sponsors, we're kind of trapped with some cash right now, so we're hoping for a big sponsor to come along and help us along. 
There was no question about it that Beach Ridge Motor Speedway had a group of the perhaps the best looking cars in the house. And it's kind of appropriate that the owner of the Speedway's son, Glenn Cusack, would own one of these beauties. Well, we have Cherry Coke this year instead of Coke. Last year we was down here for, well, the last two years I guess we've been here with Coca-Cola. And uh, this year uh, I see the new Cherry Coke cans and I see that would probably make a sharp looking race car. So uh, we ended up doing that and they come out pretty good. New uniforms and everything, so we get a lot of compliments on it. Well, usually we start, uh, we get done racing the 1st of October and then we take a month off and do a little hunting and fishing and then we get right back and we start the 1st of November and uh, we completely strip the car from one end to the other, steam clean it, uh, buy new bodies, paint all the panels, do all the body work and everything and put them back together. It's a lengthy process, but it takes a couple nights a week and usually a Saturday and uh, sooner or later you get it done. Well, we race at Beach Ridge Speedway on the Saturday night show. Uh, and we're going to take in all those shows. I think there's like 34 shows there, and uh, we're going to run a couple of trips up to Oxford, I guess, uh, and possibly a few other outside shows, but uh, it's basically right at Beach Ridge. So. Yeah, I work at the Speedway, and it takes time away from the race car, but uh, it's one of those things that uh, you race when you can with the weather you can and all that stuff in the summertime, and uh, fortunately my job when I race uh, I have to work at the track too, but uh, on Saturday night I don't have a lot to do at the track. It's mostly during the week for maintenance stuff, but uh, it interferes with it. <laughs> Does that give you an advantage? No, no advantage. Uh, we don't do any track testing or anything like that during the week just for the Saturday night competitors. It uh, wouldn't be fair for them. They'd all want to be after it. So we kind of have a policy that nobody tests during the week, and you know that's basically about it. So uh, I don't know if I wasn't working there, I probably wouldn't be track testing either. But uh, if we didn't own the place, probably be a different story then. What's your outlook for the rest of the season? Uh, great. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We're looking for uh, some good shows, and uh, last year we did real good in the point standings and everything, and I think this year uh, we're going to do even better. My personal favorite and the best-appearing modified in the asphalt category was Lou Weatherby's beautiful number three. Uh, it's a 1990 Troya. It's brand new, something we picked up in November. Uh, we put it together in about six and a half weeks. Uh, we were ready for the Augusta Civic Center show. We went up there, had a good turnout, and uh, another five or six weeks, uh, we're ready to go racing, and I can't wait. Well, we plan to hit a few uh, different tracks. Uh, we have two cars. We have our last year's car and this car, and uh, uh, we hope to hit a few tracks, uh, especially in New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Connecticut. And, we drove last year, I won three times. Uh, I still have my original front bumper on the car. Uh, uh, I still drive uh, hard enough to win, and the chrome uh, doesn't bother. Uh, we take pretty good care of the car. Uh, this car ought to go real well. Yeah, it's a brand new car. Uh, the offset is a little different from my last year's car, and uh, I think it'll, uh, it'll handle real well. Right, right from opening day, we, we'll be right there. There is no question about it, there's definitely some beautiful, impressive cars on display here at Racerama 1990. But now it's time to pack things up and head on to the first stop on the NASCAR Winston Modified Tour. And the racing action will take place there in beautiful Martinsville, Virginia, as the Modified Tour is about to kick off its 1990 season. So I guess there's one thing left, and that's to load this television monitor and all the equipment into the van and head to the sunny south. We'll see you next week for great racing action, Southern style, from Martinsville Speedway at Martinsville, Virginia. Until then, we say take care, and we'll see you again next time for the best in racing action right here with us on Race Week. Bye-bye now.